Hello and welcome to the Engage Nation podcast. Today I've got Ben Turner, Head of Sports Partnerships, APAC at Sport Radar. Ben, thanks very much for jumping on. It's been a long time coming. No worries, Karen. No worries, Karen. It's good to, uh, good to be here and uh, yeah, great to be on. Awesome. Let's get straight into it. Um, I want you to take us a bit behind the curtain. Sport Radar has some really interesting partnerships with um, with, with with governing bodies, with big leagues, uh, professional leagues, uh, NSOs. Um, can you take us behind the curtain a little bit of some of those partnerships? I mean, NBA, UEFA, MLB, NASCAR. What are, what are some of the biggest challenges for leagues and governing bodies when it comes to gathering data and insights in, in 2023? Yeah, no worries. So, um Sport Radar, um, as you said, does work with some of the biggest and the um, the most successful sporting brands in the world: NBA, NHL, MLB, from a from a US perspective. But we're much broader than that. We're really a global um, sports data and technology company that's working with the likes of UEFA, FIFA, the Bundesliga in Germany, the ICC, um, coming up the ATP. Um, but also closer, home, closer to home in this region, the NBL here in Australia, um, the Australian Baseball League, the Korean um, Football League. So we have a really broad depth of partnerships across the business. And we very much have a focus on, on the fan and, and that's what we talk a lot about um, today and help, help those sports to really take advantage of the opportunities to engage with their fans and create new experiences with those fans. Um, they're all amazing businesses doing amazing things, but in 2023 and, and beyond, um, data is a, data is a huge focus for all of those leagues and in, in many different ways. Um, we help to collect, we help to analyze, we help to create insights, we help to tell the story of the game and the story of the, um, of the event, and we help to disseminate or distribute that to various mediums where fans are, right? And, and, Today, fans are everywhere. Fans are fans are um, watching on TV at home. They're watching on a their phone on an OTT platform. They're on social media. They're betting on the game. They're playing fantasy. They're doing all these types of things. They're buying jerseys. They're at the game. Of course, we shouldn't forget that they're at the game. Um, and Sport Radar really aims to support and connect all of those um, sports leagues to help make best use of their data and to create this experience for the fan um, that helps them engage easier and helps them engage in a more meaningful way. Fantastic. It is all encompassing. It's a, and, and it's, it only feels like it's been growing enormously um, more recently. Um, can you give us a, an example of something that you're working on at the moment um, with, with, with one of your partners, probably um, in APAC, because that's what, what you're focused on. But, yeah, it'd be great to hear some of the, some of the cool stuff you're up to. Yeah, no worries. So, so I might um I might pick one here in Oz because we're we're both in Oz, and and I'll do one in the broader broader uh, APAC region. But uh, we started working with the Australian Baseball League um, over twelve months ago now, and we've we really focus on them on how do we help them connect with their fans. They're a they're a growing league. Um, they're they're a challenger league. They're trying to compete with the AFLs, the NRLs, the the footballs, the basketballs of, of the country. Um, but what what we've found with them is that technology and helping them to use technology can really help them engage with their fans. So together with the ABL and Baseball Australia, we launched a brand new OTT platform to help provide an avenue for them to connect directly with their fans. And I think um, it's a great way for them to have a first party relationship with their fans. In the in the old world, you know, when, when you and I were watching the NBA, I um, think you're a bit younger than me, but uh, we, were, we might have been watching the NBA on Channel 10 and in the, in the 90s, right, in the Saturday morning um, highlight show. Um, fans and, and the NBA on Channel 10, no idea who we are, right? No idea that we were fans. But today um, we want to provide technology that helps sports to understand who their fans are and connect them with those fans. And with the ABL, we do that with an OTT platform that's really driven new engagement opportunities for baseball, both in Australia, but also um, outside Australia. And, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's um, over the past few years, it's actually been a Korean uh, team based down in Geelong um, that's played in the Australian Baseball League. And, and so that's enabled the ABL to stream those games into Korea and, and to create an even broader audience for, for their fans. Um, moving to Korea now for the, for the second example, 
we've actually had a partnership with the Korean Football League, the K League, for the past um, three years, and and um, they are doing some amazing things. They're a really progressive um, and invested league who are who are thinking about technology, thinking about innovation, thinking about the fan. And we have a broad ranging partnership across um, audio visual distribution, across data um, distribution, and, and again around an OTT platform. Now they're a different size property to an ABL, and 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 they think about um, connecting with a different subset of fans. So they have players from Indonesia, from Brazil, um, from other parts of Southeast Asia, and so their strategy around OTT, which we're helping to drive with them is very much about connecting with fans outside of their core market. So they've done a great job of commercializing their um, their game, their event in the Korean market, and we're helping them connect and attract fans outside, um, outside the Korean market and to drive new opportunities to engage with those fans and really somewhat move them, move them from the, the world of social um, viewing and social connection into a platform again that's owned and operated by the K League, and they can tell their story and talk to their fans in in their tone of voice. Fantastic. So, I'd like to jump on the ABL one a little bit. Um, what What are some of the you, you're starting to gather all this data and all these insight, insights? I'd be I'd be interested to know what what is it telling you about um, the growth of that league? So, um, for anyone who isn't um, from from Australia, uh, from Australia, listening listening to this, um, this is it's a pretty heavily AFL dominated um, media landscape. For example, um, I know if you're um, on the east coast, it might be a bit more rugby focused, but certainly um, some would say it's reasonably saturated. Is there is there is the data telling you that there's you know room for you know a league like the ABL? I mean, it's a it's a it's a big sport in the US, obviously, in Japan. Um, but what about in Australia? Is there space for that? Is there demand there? And you know, is, are some of this uh, stuff you're building for them with this OTT platform and just generally with their their tech strategy? Um, yeah, what 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 is that telling you? Yes, yeah, so I think I think technology is an enabler, right, for sports and uh, sports mature at different rates. The AFL was not the AFL or the NRL was not the NRL we know today 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? It was a much different proposition and leagues grow over time. Um, what we're seeing today in 2023 is we're actually seeing a, somewhat of a democratisation um, of, of that next tier of league where they can actually embrace technology and it becomes an enabler for them to accelerate their growth and maturity, right? And And... Technology is accessible now. It's as accessible as it's ever been. Um, sports are in, sports are embracing it at a at a faster rate. I still think they've got some room to go to to embrace it. But really, there's for leagues like the ABL, right? It's this opportunity where you either take ownership of your your future, your maturity, your growth, your commercialization opportunities, and embrace technology, or or you don't, right? And you stay as an operator of competitions, right? And I, and I think that's what we're finding, not just in Australia, but globally now, and, and the ABL is a great leader for that, is that sports that are embracing technology, that are taking advantage of a broad range, whether it is an OTT platform, whether it's a CRM, whether it's a um, data collection, whether it's automated video production, whatever the technology, sports that have an innovation and growth mindset, um, can use technology to take the next step. And that takes time, right? Like sports traditionally play for six months of the year, three to six months in their league, right? So they've only got a certain amount of time to grow and then they're back into planning and they're back into that cycle again. So their ability to continually um, take step um, jumps forward with technology to accelerate their growth and ultimately, and I'll, I'll come back to it, I've said it a few times, but get closer to their fans, right? Because no matter whether you are the AFL, the NRL, or the ABL, you have a you have a section of fans that are interested in your game. There is a there is a you know big interest in baseball um, globally, especially in the APAC region. When you talk about Japan, Korea, um, you know it's growing here in Australia. But you need to know who those fans are, and if you do know who those fans are. It gives you the opportunity to engage with them more and to and to continue to grow as a sport. Ben, you mentioned um, that sport as an industry, you know, the uptick on new trying out new technology is still probably a little bit slower 
um, than maybe other industries. Uh, why? Yeah, why I, is that? Uh, I think I think, and I mentioned it before. I think they're going a little bit faster, but it's still an, it's still a segment that's going faster. So you've got some sports that have kind of tipped the edge, right, and tipped over the edge and said, okay, we are. We want to embrace technology. We want to innovate. We're, we're gonna we're gonna go for it. We're gonna test and trial, right? And the the NBA have led that, right? They've led that culture, um, digital first, fan first, social first, um, and they've reaped the benefits of that. And you see their growth from a from every metric you you look at: fan, social, media revenue, um, ticket revenue, sponsorship. They've they've used that um, fostering of innovation and kind of a try everything approach uh, adam silver's uh, uh, an amazing leader and a, and a real pioneer right but he's had this try everything approach now they're the nba are big they're, they're, they can kind of try everything and they can test um getting that down practically down to that to the to the other levels of sport is i think it's sometimes slower one because of seasonality right so if you're only if you're only playing once so over six months and then you're in an off season Sports are really focused during the season on on delivering and execution, and so there's only a certain window with which you can invest and build and grow the new technology for the next season, right? But I think sports have started to think about how do I how do we adopt how do we think about longer term planning how do we how do we pilot technology test it quickly um, fail quickly right test and fail quickly is a is a great great model. Um, and then and then find ways for what works and embrace it. But I still think sports traditionally, you know, are um, uh, still an older generation of um, without segmenting here, an older generation of administrators, right? And and sometimes that takes time to to understand the technology, to be comfortable with it, to embrace it. Um, and you know, sports really need. Um, an understanding of, you know, a high level understanding of all of these different technologies. But what they need is they need innovative technology, digital driven people to help drive discussion, drive ideas, drive debate to to find ways to embrace new technology, right? And 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 embrace what works for them, um, and not be afraid to fail, right? Take some risks and 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 see what happens. Yeah, I think my reflection on. That is sport. Sports incredibly public, um, uh, and there is lots of like when you're a fan, you are a, a big time fan. Therefore, you are quite passionate about something. You're very passionate. I'm watching. Um, I'm a bit slow, but I'm you know I'm watching Welcome to Wrexham at the moment. And when things don't go wrong uh, over there, they absolutely hear about it. Um, and 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 that 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 applies to leagues to teams. You know, people are passionate about it. People care. And that's one well, way a, a huge opportunity obviously. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, building that something like that in public um, and failing, like you mentioned, failing fast, a bit scary yeah. as well, yeah. right? Yeah, it is, it's definitely scary. And you're right, there is, there is that, that perception and it's finding the models that allow you to work alongside partners, right, to test in, in maybe a, um, uh, a smaller pilot or some way to get comfortable along the way, right? I think the 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 tech the sports technology industry has really matured over the past um, decade, and, and especially here in Australia with all the investment into and, and growth of sports tech companies. But companies are now finding ways to help de-risk that for sport, right? And to kind of work alongside them to test and to and to and to be ready when the big day comes, right? Um, and and yes, you can't you can't stuff up on the first day of the Ashes or the first or the um, you know the grand final of the AFL, right? That that is the unique thing about sport is it you have to be ready at your peak, and everyone around it has to be ready at their peak for that game day, right? The players, the coaches, the media, everyone it has to go well. So there does have to be planning, um, but I think tech, sport focused technology, right? As as a um, that understands that, like technology companies understand those challenges of sport. And the greater that technology companies understand that challenge of sport, the greater they can help and facilitate that, right? And I think we've got a really good um, community of, or industry now, that understands sports challenge and can plan and work to that, right? Which does help to accelerate adoption and and, and engage with the fan. And um, I also think the, the other, you know, just going back to the fan, I think it's about communication as well, right? Like, 
how do you communicate that you're innovative and technology focused and and how do you have that discussion with your fan how do you find niches within your fan base to test things right uh, i'll go to the nbl as a perfect example i don't want to go too deep on nfts right because um it, it's it's came and it, and it went and it's we'll see where it ends up right but i think lots of sports tried to um embrace the nba top shot model after it after it peaked during COVID. um and one one sport that I liked what they did um, was the NBL here in Australia. They launched their chains um, platform, but they didn't they didn't they didn't go huge with it, right? They communicated it to a very niche audience, and they communicated it as that they were they were learning alongside their community and their fan base, and that they wanted to um, kind of share that experience and, and work out what their fans really want, right? And the way that they communicated that plan. I think enabled them to to test and continue to test what works and what doesn't, right? And and um, that that's a respectful way to engage with your fans without um, without having their passion override that 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 fear of doing something wrong or making a mistake. Yeah, I think there's there's a great deal of power in um, being really honest in your communication with those. You know, you'd be surprised. Give the fans some credit. You know, the, uh, you'd be surprised the sort of how on board they would be if you're just honest and upfront, going, "We're giving this a go. Uh, it is very new, uh, but we thought, yeah, and you're special. You know, we like, we picked you out to um, help 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 trial this. Who wouldn't be up for that? And then they almost feel like they're part of it. They always feel like they've got some co ownership there, which is really important too. And they go. Oh, I was actually I actually helped get that off the ground, you know, as a as a you know as a customer. Yep. That's how you do it. Yep. Yeah, hundred hundred percent, right? Finding those find those loyal, passionate fans that that you can work with, that you can make them feel even more important to what you're doing as a sporting organization, um, and and have them in the inner circle, right? To 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 innovate and, and really understand what that engagement opportunity is. So I'm thinking about the NBA is the gold class and I'm thinking about sort of those, yeah, yeah, the tier under, whatever that is, and it's probably pretty broad, that tier under. Uh, Is this about creating, is this a resource thing? Uh, Because as you said, you know, they could just operate the league, you know, or um, and just run it and it'd be fine. Um, They're obviously, you know, it would be, it's an investment in their time and potentially, you know, in, 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 um, in money as well. Uh, But, is is that is that what's also holding them back? Not just you know the fear of what we're talking about here, but but also just to feel a, a people powered thing um, as well as that learning mindset you speak about. Because you know I know some leagues that well we've come from the big V world, you know the state basketball league, as you know, and you're aware of, and and it was literally a few a few of us just trying to run the thing um, and having time to then go somebody going oh you should try this technology, you'd be like oh god. This feels like another thing, um, but is it is it a resource thing? I think that's a broad question for lots of different leagues. Yeah, I think that I think there is a there is a resource thing, right? Um, and challenge and and sports. Let's let's. I, I actually think the job of the sports administrator today, and I'm just uh, use the sports administrator as a, as a global yeah. term, CEO, leader, board, um, is a really complex one, right? Sport is dealing with so many complex issues, and and technology sometimes. You know how do you how do you find the time right? Because once you get into the technology space, you've got these you've got machine learning, you've got AI, you've got computer vision, you've got blockchain, you've got NFTs, you've got all these things right. And I think in sports sometimes we we talk um, as an industry about these big technologies, and I think we can how we can help, and, and we're definitely. Um, Definitely doing this at Sport Radar and thinking about the fan and how do we how do we deliver the products to sport that they can use, right? And yes, they may use they're going to use machine learning, they're going to leverage computer vision, they're going to leverage different technology advances. But what are the products that are going to change the game, right? And and if you go back to your big V days with um with Justin Nelson, right? Yeah, you know, I think you guys had three or four people, right? Like running running the league, running the um, the weekly show. Um, doing match reports, and I think there's like eight or ten different, maybe there's fifteen different competitions, right? Like it was a mass, it was a massive effort, and and people would complain and say like, why why didn't our, our league get um get a mention in this this week, right? And a lot. and that, that's that's a hard job, right? But you guys are out there producing this content, and 
and um, finding a way to engage with your fan base, right? And sports that embrace that and sports that do that and think in an agile way, right? How do you do something of high quality in a small way no, you're gonna know you're gonna have some detractors, right? Sometimes detractors are good. It means they're talking about the game, right? Um, they're talking about you. They're not talking about AFL or NRL from a big B point of view. Um, and uh, and that's that's a way to um, uh, to accept that there's going to be some criticism, but innovate in a small way and do something of high quality. Which um, I think again, you know, if I go back to the start about what sports. Um, have a way to get a competitive advantage from others in the market is to embrace innovation and technology and sports are, are doing that despite the resource challenges, right? There'll always be resource challenges based on revenue that's available and, and what they, their ambitions are. And they've got to balance that out in a, you know, one, two, three, four, five year plan. So we are talking about APAC at the moment, the region. We certainly um, focused on that. And I, I know you you are, obviously. And I just want to explore where that sort of sits in the global landscape. I know lots of lots of technology, actually, new technology actually gets trialled in places like Australia and New Zealand, like Contactless did, for example, before anywhere else, contactless payments, that is. That, that's an example because of the size of the population. It's kind of like a for, for, on, on that scale, a small a smaller uh, test bed. Does that happen um, in sport here at all? Is there any, and where does it where does it sit? Where are we that far behind, or are we able because we're a bit smaller and you know um, have that ability to trial stuff? Are we are we um, actually you know, um, pioneering some some tech? Yeah, so I, I think it's a really um, really good question. Like from our point of view, we're working with almost all tier one sports in Australia in some way, right? We're broad business covering integrity, commercialization, fan engagement, league operations, products, but we're working with the cricket Australia, football Australia, basketball Australia, the NBL, NRL, AFL, baseball Australia, Australian Baseball League. So we have this really big cross section to learn from and understand. And what I think Australia has done very, very well um, in sport is we are very passionate about it and we have, you know, we have an expectation of, of quality, right, whether it is our, our local footy um, on a Saturday or local cricket, right, or it's the, you know, it's, it's Australia, England and the Ashes. Um, we, we have an expectation of what we, how we want to consume that. And because of that, and because of our, I think our culture, right? Like our, um, our kind of, um, uh, you know, dig in. Put it, put us in a box. Put, put us in a box, Ben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we dig in, right? And we, we, we then, we then yeah. say we're going to get, we're going to, we're going to overachieve, right? Like we, we overachieve big time for a nation of, I think we're about twenty five or twenty six million people now, right? But I think that accelerates in sport, right? And. We, we are very much a, um, a Jer Jerome Engel, um, University of Berkeley. I, I learned this from the ASTN and, um, and James Demetrio invited me to a um, session with him one time and he talked about innovation clusters, right? I think in Australia, we have these sport innovation clusters where sport is so ingrained in our daily lives, in our community and what we do that we become these perfect test beds for testing this technology, testing these, this equipment, testing this business model, testing this, um, these rules, right? And we're then able to, to test and we're able to innovate and we're, we've got to continue to innovate because otherwise, um, as a sport, we're always competing against each other. We're, we're the most popular, we have the most, well, Melbourne especially, we have the most professional sporting teams of any city anywhere in the world, right? Um, so competition is fierce and competition breeds innovation um, and it breeds adoption and it breeds how do you get a competitive advantage. And because of all those things, um, Australian sports are, are probably, you know, more open to having the discussion about how do we test something, how do we use a piece of technology and sports tech companies find it as a great market because of all of those factors as well to test and then take it, take it to the broader world. And I think you've seen lots of technology over the years um, Years do that, right? Um, from a, uh, yeah, in early days, a catapult and a, and a sporting pulse who um, 
you know, we, we, I, I worked for back in the day and you, um, you were a client of the big, the big V, um, they were the early pioneers of technology that went, that went global and had a big impact. Right. And today there's so many, right? Like you, every single sports, um, tech company is, um, uh, is testing locally, but trying to go globally. And Australia has an amazing reputation on the international stage, right? So if you can have success here in this market as a sports tech company, you can pretty much drive your product globally, I think. And that, um, that means that Australian sports have a great opportunity to, um, to be pioneers and to be seen as innovative and, and, um, and ride that wave along the way. So I, was, I want to zoom out a little bit. We're talking about Australia now, and now I want to look at a more global view. Imagine there's a sort of an appetite scale, of an innovation appetite scale from absolutely don't want to try anything new to um, the Richard Branson, screw it, let's do it. <laughs> and um, I, was, I did a piece on this recently where I'm sort of got, in my head, I've got uh, certainly on a match day anyway, to begin with, you've got the UK, which is... Um, especially for football, um, no, this is the way it is. Give me my product. I don't want any fire. I don't want any rap music. I don't want anything. I just want. <laughs> I just want to go and watch the football and have a pint. Then you've got on the other end of the scale, you've got the US, which will uh, is a now an entertainment. You know, it's a it's a rock concert. You know, I went to Denver recently and it was just out of control. You know, lights. Um, music, you know, all the above, cheerleaders, you know, T-shirt cannons, you know the drill. And uh, I, I, my, my, my reflection was that Australia probably sits somewhere in the middle, um, probably maybe starting to skew. Where, where do you see that um, in terms of uh, the between the three sort of, I don't know, core Western Western sort of um, entertainment um, countries and cultures? Yeah, so I think you, I think you you're right. There's a very traditional fan base. We've probably seen that during the Ashes um, over the past few weeks um, in the UK. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, now that, now now some of them are out. Right? They're uh, they're not there anymore. But uh, no, no. I think I, I think that's you know it's culture as much as anything, right? But I think you um, in the UK, yeah, the game of soccer has oh football I should say um, has. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the right thing there. Um, has maintained a really traditional approach, right? And I, I actually think one of the reasons you're seeing US and different investment into football in the UK now is that they see opportunities to grow that and, and think about that in the in the US fold, right? In the US today, going to a sporting event is an experience from the moment you leave your house to the moment you get home, right? Like you can listen to the radio, you can you can watch TV before you go home. As you get to the venue, you're you kind of directed with outlines in a seamless experience with no lines at the concession. You can go get food at your seat. You can buy your merchandise. Um, they they drive everything around the fan, right? There's fan activations in venue on the big screens. They're built to be entertainment venues with the sport being played, but but. Um, part of the overall entertainment of a, of an evening or a day experience for the fan, right? And and they do that to an unbelievably good level and and find ways to engage that fan. They understand the value of the fan. Um, they understand how that experience drives all of their avenues of revenue from sponsorship to ticket sales to merchandise sales to concession sales, and they are um, they are creating that experience. In Australia, I think we're, I think we've, I think we've come along. We, we kind of sit, I think, culturally from a sport perspective, somewhere in the middle. We've got our traditionalists, right? You know, I don't know if I want the, I don't know if I want the music on at the basketball, right? Um, I don't know if the music on at the football, but I think sports here have, have slowly started to adapt certain things over the past five to 10 years and are really having great success that is, that is creating that premium experience, right? And that that's what it what's what it's about. And the US, um, I think, has to continue to build that premium experience because their venues are only certain a certain size, right? So if you talk about an, an NBA, NHL um, arena, it's 20, 20 to twenty four thousand seats, right? Every game is sold out pretty much. 
So how do they continue to grow is their challenge, right? So they have to continue to invest in premium experiences and delivering those experiences. Um, I think in Australia, we're, we're getting to that point where we've, we've maybe had some bigger stadiums that don't always, you know, we're, we're fortunate with the MCG and, and Marvel and other stadiums that don't always sell out unless you're a Collingwood fan and you get 70,000. I was there at the Frio game the other week and it's 68,000, I think, for a Collingwood Frio game at the G, right? That's, that's amazing, right? They're doing, they're doing different types of engagement as well, music, interaction with the big screen, you know, um, roving microphone, all of those things to try and connect with those fans as they're sitting in the arena. Um, and it's both the physical experience that, that um, is being done well, but I think it's also the digital second screen experience now, right? And I think Mark Cuban's famously quoted for, for let's, not, let's not interrupt the fan when they're watching the game on their phone, right? They should be watching the, they're watching the game. But I think sport today, there's lots of stoppages, right? Like, as, as a fan, I know you're probably the same, right? You're a little bit younger than me, but similar type age and, and demographic, right? Like, I want to know who's kicked the goals. I want to know, oh, I saw that player get injured down the field. I want to know what happened to them. So I pick up my phone and I, I try and get more information, right? And I want that digital experience so I can fully engage with the with the contest and the match or to share a photo or to share, uh, share something on uh, social media, right? Um, while the game's on, I want to sit there and watch it. But while there's a stoppage, I want to be able to engage and, and delivering that digital experience in a seamless way. And, and I think owning that digital experience as a league or a team um, is, is really, really important, right? Because, you know, again, if we go back to the, to the broadcast television um, point from earlier, not understanding or knowing about that fan is a, is a, is a disadvantage today, right? How do I know and, and understand that fan today and, and what they're doing during the game? And can I send them an offer to go get some chips or, or some merchandise well at half time, right? Because I know that they're in the app checking something else. I'm going to give you a bit of an assist here, Ben. So on this question, so all these things that, especially the US, when you were talking about them, know a lot, a lot about their fan. How do they know so much about their fan? Where did that? Where does that? Where does that come from? What's the? What's the? What's the? Yeah, reverse engineering that. Where? where um, what's the back end look like? Yeah. So, uh, I think they are um, CRM wise. They've been better than most at, at capturing and understanding and and um, investing in that right. So I think I was, I was talking to someone from a team the other day and they were telling me that um, they, they are now ringing uh, members. They can anticipate how many members are not turning up to a, or season ticket holders in the US, I should say, rather than members, um, who are not going to turn up to the game tonight, whatever the sport. And they're ringing those season ticket holders and they're saying, hey, can we help you sell your ticket on the secondary marketplace can we give you a ticket to a charity? We're doing this activation with the charity and we'd like to use that ticket. Um, we want to make sure the stadium is full. We, we pretty much know. We know you're not going to come because we've built all these insights about you um, and are capturing that. We want to maximize the experience for everyone. Are you happy to do that, right? Now, the fan feels like they're, they're important because they're getting that phone call. Um, they feel like they can either sell their ticket or they can contribute back to the, to the team, right, the team they love, the team they want to support. And... They're doing that with, um, you know, advanced CRM tools and other technologies um, and I assume using AI and, and, and machine learning to really drill down to um, how, do, how do they collect better insights and, and use those insights to make decisions to maximise their attendance and revenues. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and yeah, I mean, I wasn't trying to be a plug for us, but we're a great CRM um, <laughs> here at Engage RM. So, um, the one one of the things that you're certainly referring to here is um, the value of of first party data as well, um, and I know this is something we really wanted to talk about was when you were talking about when we were doing BVTV back in the day. You know, it would have been great if that was you know an option, but ultimately it was on YouTube. And that's fine, um, but what what are we missing? What would we have been missing out on, and what are leagues missing out on? Because there is a bit of a, 
a shift, I suppose, between those social media channels and um, towards an over the top um, platform like uh, like what Sports Radar do. Yeah, so I think I think um, cost um, cost made it um, harder back in the day, big VTV, and accessibility was easy, right? It was easy to put it on YouTube or Facebook, right? And and that's where the audience was. The audience has become more fragmented now across lots of different platforms, right? They're not just on Facebook. They're not, oh, there's a different generation on Facebook. They're on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, and I think sports have worked out that they can uh, achieve distribution through social, but they can't really have that discussion and understand and tell that tell that story directly themselves, right? They, they want to own that experience with the fan they want to be able to understand the fan to generate those insights to create those um that next level of um engagement and it's all about what are the what are the tools to actually capture first party data right and i think again five ten years ago we we all thought about data as collecting the email address and collecting the mobile phone number and then sending SMS and, and email newsletters, right? Um, that's kind of the, you know, the the past of CRM or collect information. I think we're so far past that in terms of how do we best connect, right? Whether it's an OTT platform, whether it's a um, a, a, a tagging of a website, whether it's a um, understanding that they're on a different o- they're on the K League OTT platform and the ABL web ott platform and we can understand that that person might be a fan of korean football and the korean team of baseball in geelong right and using that fan um, information to then position opportunities for them right in the in their world that's less in your face than an email or an sms right it's really about targeting that fan and helping to support that fan to to best um engage with what they want at the right time. And the OTT platform is a tool that helps you um, or a a, uh, platform that helps you get there, right? It helps you understand your fans. It helps you, it helps the K-League to understand how many of their fans from Indonesia are watching the Division II um, K-League because they've got their Indonesian player playing in one of their teams, right? And then once they know that, how do they then help to engage those fans even more, right? What other technologies can they use to engage and excite those fans in different ways? Yeah, interesting. I think there's also the um, when uh, when you're trying to so after you engage, you, sometimes you'll try and monetize, uh, which is fair enough. Uh, and I think back in the day, you'd be able to sell things like we got this many likes and this many views, and you could you could actually sell that to a potential partner. But these days, that um, is getting diced and you know fabricated and we don't really know what engagement means anymore on a lot of those social media platforms uh and do you think that's where uh, this epiphany of first party data is coming about even more so is because of things like elon musk just mucking just mucking around with with twitter or whatever it's called now whatever it's called yeah yeah that's right um do you think that has something to do well uh, to do with the, the the more momentum, I suppose, towards the importance of capturing first party data because of the instability of some of these other channels. Yeah, yeah, I think it's sports taking ownership or control of what um, of their business, right, of their environment. Uh, I'll give you an ex- example. I was um, lucky enough, fortunate enough, to be um, invited to All Star Weekend in in Utah this year. Um, yeah, you with Ned. Yeah, we saw Ned. Ned yeah, we um, yeah, we hung out. We got a couple of photos, which was great. Um, but one of the things the NBA did to the whole city and they take over a city when they do like all-star week and everything's branded across the, the whole city, um, hotels and restaurants and bars, everything, but very quiet, not, not quietly. Right. But they had these things called NBA ID with these, with these QR codes everywhere. Right. And the NBA have, have, have taken this approach, right? Let's try and get everyone, all our fans signed up to an NBA ID that becomes our gateway to their League Pass platform, to their other um, platforms and offerings that they have. And they did like a physical activation to 
generate awareness, but also engagement around this ID, right? What do you get by having an MBA ID? And I just thought it was a really, um, it, it wasn't a huge, it wasn't huge, it wasn't a big deal made about it, but it was a really smart way to activate and to build momentum around understanding your fan, right? And getting getting to connect that fan data with your ticketing platform, with your um, uh, fantasy platform, with other games that you're doing, right? All of these avenues now are ways to collect that first party data and to have a better understanding of your fan and to be able to better service them, right? And and it's not about, it's not always, it's not really about sending a 20% off voucher or a 10% off voucher, right? It is about understanding who our top 20% of fans are and how we can build products and how we can create the experience in a way that engages them more so that they continue to love the sport. Fantastic. I'd almost finish it there, but I do it because it was such a good way to finish. But I do have one more, one, one, one question. So always good to finish with the crystal ball. Um, and you probably, we've alluded to this, and it might end up being a little bit of an overview of some of the things we've discussed around uh, tech and innovation in the sports industry. But what are the next, what are the next five to ten years look like? You know, uh, AI is the easy answer, but you know, what's the application of that? You know, what how, practically, what, how does that help sports teams, leagues, entertainment venues, all the above? Take it to the next level. What's what are the innovations you think we'll see? Yeah. So um, themes are out. Number one, it's about the fan. It's about engaging their fan and creating experiences, right? So everything comes off that. Um, now, I, we haven't spoken about um, performance or, or on court um, technology, right? There's a lot of technology there. I think that will continue to innovate, and fans will want more understanding um, of what is happening in the event, whether it's tracking data, whether it's um, AI and computer vision to automate the box score or to automate data and to be able to tell an even grander story or, or bigger story to the fan, I think your on-court performance technology will continue to advance, right? Not, not, the, uh, not, not your heart rate, not your really scientific medical information, right? That's, that's confidential. That stays close, right? I don't think any leagues or players want to want to – Release that or get that out there, right? That's going to continue to advance. But that stuff that fans are engaged, are interested in around how hard is my team performing? How um, how successful have I been? Why have I been successful? And what are the insights that can be created with AI, machine learning, um, and different technologies, right? And insights for fans based on performance but also insights of fans that help drive business and drive commercialization, right? So you've got your underlying technology that will build products to collect, to analyze, but it's very much that insight layer in between that connects with the fans and engage and creates, creates new experiences, right? And those new experiences might be augmented reality. It might be, um, you know, uh, uh, more digital experiences around collectibles, right? I think collectibles continue to be, um, you know, I said before we came on, on air that I had my, uh, my basketball card boxes uh, down the floor that I moved, right? Like I think sports fans still like to collect collectibles, whether they're digital or, or physical. And um, anything we can do to generate insights around our fans to better service the needs and make those products more accessible to the global audience um, I think is going to be uh, delivers that fan experience and, and engagement piece. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much for your insights there. I mean, it's got such a broad uh, view of the sports and technology industry, that intersection there, certainly in the uh, in the region, but globally as well. So it's been fantastic. That 45 minutes just about went incredibly quickly yeah, for it's, me. It's flow, mate. <laughs> <laughs> just time flies when you're having fun so thanks again for coming on mate we'll uh, have to catch up again so your, your office is only over just uh 20 meters from mine so we'll have to catch up yeah we are we're, we're lucky enough to be to be based at the um uh with with the astn and with engage rm and lots of other great sports technology companies here in melbourne um at, at launchpad and um you know so it, it is a real hub you feel it every day i feel it every day it's a real hub for sports technology so i think the industry is um it's got a bright future, um, not just in Melbourne, but in, in Australia more broadly as well. 
Couldn't have said it better, mate. Fantastic. So, yeah, have a, have a good rest of your day, mate. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Callum.